Good morning, church. Good morning, and thanks to the worship team. So good to see you again. One of the dangers of preaching last week about lying down in the traffic is that, uh, yeah, we had a challenging week. I don't know how yours was, uh, but uh, Tuesday when I got home, having taken the girls to school, coming to the office and getting home, I'd been in the car for five minutes short of three hours. And I think from Tuesday, uh, everything went pear-shaped in terms of trying to get through from my side on the West Rand. But uh, God is good, and I had to learn to practice what I had preached and to uh, pray in the traffic and uh, pray for other people in the traffic actually more so (laughs) as they try to cut me off and do strange things into oncoming traffic, just crazy people out there. I hope none of you. But uh, open to the Scriptures, to Psalm 23, and uh, we're going a verse at a time each week, just taking a a, a meditatory view of the psalm, just slowing down in, in our culture Uh, to read God's word. So I encourage you to keep it open there. And we we come to verse three. In 1991, 11 year old J.C. Dugard was abducted on her way to school by a couple called Philip and Nancy Garrido. Think this little 11 year old girl. And if you follow the story at the time, you would know that they kept her in captivity for 18 years. 18 years until she was found in 2009, aged 29 years of age. How do you get back with your family and recapture history? I mean, the mind boggles. I've seen on Netflix, they've got the show on there, so they've actually got interviews. You can see what the property looked like. She lived in this little uh, tent in the back garden. They built a second wall in the garden so people outside couldn't look in. And um, Philip Garrido, Uh, fathered his first child with little J.C. when she was only 13 years old. And he ended up having another two children with her. And so she endured uh, abuse over those years by both of them. Both of them have been convicted life in prison, both Philip and Nancy. But the one thing that has always puzzled me is why J.C. de God never tried to run away and never tried to escape. She never even revealed her true identity to anyone, even though she had many opportunities, because in the latter years, she went shopping with her parents and uh, opened the front door. It's quite horrific that the police, I think, over the years had made about five different uh, encounters with the couple, been to the home, uh, but had never connected the dots. And I I'm puzzled why she didn't run away, and then when I think about her situation, I realize that probably the level of abuse was just too traumatic. The fact that her two daughters thought that she was their sister and not their mother, she she had just gone too far, was in too deep, uh, that she'd accepted that evil as normal. But as I think about that story, I think about us. And you know what perhaps puzzles me even more? than the story of J.C. de God who didn't try and run away from evil, is why you and I, as the sheep of God, would ever choose to run away from pure goodness. Why do you and I choose to run away from a shepherd who is supremely holy, supremely loving, supremely good, who's the complete polar opposite of Philip Garrido, and yet we have this bent and this tendency to run away, to choose to go down a road of unrighteousness, a road of sin, a road that we know because we've been there before that only ends up raping and abusing us. Why do we do it? Well, David says in Psalm 23 and verse three, quite insightfully, if you glance down at your text, he says, he restores my soul. He guides me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. And when I read Psalm 23 and verse 3, I say to myself, this verse doesn't seem to fit here. We've been talking about the Lord as shepherd. We've been talking about green pastures. We've been talking about quiet waters. We've been talking about abundant provision and protection from the shepherd. So why on earth would a sheep like David ever run away? Why would he ever say that he needs to be restored? What's going on here? How does this fit? Well, I think David is more honest than most sheep. And when he says he restores my soul, he's actually implying something very disturbing about himself, but actually something very deeply honest that maybe you and I aren't as open to admit. What he's saying is I keep wandering off. I I, I keep escaping from the love of my shepherd. I, I, I keep wanting to go this way when he says go this way. And he says that's why I need restoring. 
That's why I need to be restored and brought back. And the first thing I see in our text this morning is, number one, I see my sheep condition. I see my sheep condition that I need to be restored, that I am a fellow sheep who is wayward, who keeps going astray. And I want you to see that David doesn't use the past tense here. He doesn't say, he restored my soul. He's not just looking back and saying, yeah, I had that incident with Bathsheba and I've had these other ups and downs and and, and there's a point in my past where God did a new work and he restored my soul. He's put verse three in the present continuous tense. In other words, he's saying, "Ah, I need ongoing restoration, and I need ongoing restoration because I keep veering off, I keep running away. Now to restore something means to bring it back into a state of what it had before. And maybe some of you restore old furniture and you know what that means. Maybe some of you are on IT or you've had frustrations with your computer. Your laptop needs to be restored. Why? Because the files have gone missing and you've got a virus and things have got corrupted. You need to try and see if you made that back up and now you, you've got to restore the computer to the state that it was in before it got messed up. And the Hebrew word here for restore means to cause to repent. That would be a great translation. He causes me to repent and God puts circumstances in our lives to cause us to repent. It also means to bring back to turn back, to rescue. Even the word convert, Psalm 19 says God's word converts the soul. Now I think David's like the hymn writer who cries out, what does the hymn writer say? Prone to wander, prone to wander, Lord I feel it, prone to leave the God I love. And as unfathomable as it is, every time you and I sin, we choose to wander away from the goodness and the closeness, the security, the provision we could go on of the shepherd. We choose evil over blessing. And it's unfathomable, but if we search our hearts, we know that this is true. It sounds illogical and irrational, but our hearts seem to say, yeah, I know the reality of that. And perhaps that's why God says to his people through that prophet Hosea, if you know the the background to that prophet, Hosea 11, 7, God says, and you can almost hear the the brokenness of God's heart as he wrestles with his sheep. God says, my people are determined to turn from me. My people are determined to turn from me. It's as though even though a sheep looks innocent, I don't think anyone's ever said, hey, let's not walk through that field. You know, there's sheep there. No one ever makes horror movies about killer sheep. Sheep look so innocent, but there's another side to them. Another side to them, this willful, rebellious, that that we're determined all the time, as we said on week one, to push through that fence on the edge of the freeway to, 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 to just get away from nourishment. Why? I think you and I are like those lawn bowls that I used to watch my gran bowl many years ago as a little boy. And, and, and those lawn bowls out on the bowling green, she'd bowl them, and for a while, they're going on the straight and narrow, the paths of righteousness that David talks about. And what happens? You just blink as a little boy and suddenly what's happening? They're veering off to the side right at the end. What's going on here? It was amazing. It's like I wanted to throw one and I couldn't throw it properly, but it just veers off. You and I are like those lawn bowls. We're just biased away from God. That's our natural sheep condition if we left to ourselves. Left to ourselves, we would forsake the shepherd for all eternity. And David ends the longest psalm in the Bible, Psalm 119, with these words. Psalm 119, verse 176, David says, I've strayed like a lost sheep. Seek your servant. What a beautiful prayer for you to pray this morning. Is just, Lord, that's all I can pray. Lord, every day I want to wake up and I just want to pray, Lord, seek me. Seek your servant, Lord. Just seek me, Lord. If you don't, if you don't surround me with your presence, Lord, if you don't curb my thought life, Lord, if you don't curb my behavior and my emotions, Lord, if you're not watching over me, if your presence is not guiding me, Lord, if you're not near, Lord, I'll make a wreck of my life. I'll shipwreck my faith. Lord, unless your persevering grace curbs me, I'll depart from you forever. I think to understand the background of Psalm 23 and verse 3, In a beautiful way, we need to understand this concept of what it means for a sheep to become cast. A cast sheep is a sheep that has looked for a little hollow that looks so comfortable, and it has laid down in this hollow, 
and suddenly the center of gravity has shifted and the sheep has fallen onto its back. Now it sounds quite humorous when you picture the sheep there with legs waving and flailing unless something or someone comes to help it, it, it can't right itself. And that's a picture of us. And, and maybe it seems humorous like those urban legend stories of cows that have fallen asleep in the field and people go out there and they do cow tipping while the cow's asleep, they push it over and it tips over. But this is a serious condition for a sheep. It's very serious. And as it thrashes about, trying to get back onto its feet, after a short while, the gases in its little stomach begin to bloat. And its stomach becomes bloated. Some of you might know what that feels like. Maybe you've got a bad stomach and you've felt what it's like to to have a bloated stomach. Well, you've got it easy. I think a sheep has something like four stomachs. So just imagine what that level of bloating is like. But it places the sheep in danger because as it becomes bloated, the circulation gets cut off to its extremities, starting in the legs and the feet, and begins to move its way in. And within just a few hours, a sheep can be uh, destroyed by the harsh sun lying there on its back. If it's overcast, it can maybe survive a few more days. That's not even to say, what about the predators? Will it even survive a few days? Predators are gonna say, look at this. Somebody packed up my lunch and put it here, lying upright, simply for me to devour. How does a sheep become cast? Well, there's two main ways. The first one we've already touched on, just careless comfort. Sheep's just walking along and says, this looks like a great spot, but it doesn't realize that there is danger in its comfort. Suddenly it's lying on its back. It takes the least line of resistance and you and I do the same thing. We choose in our culture of consumerism to choose comfort over obedience all the time. We neglect prayer. The reading of God's word, we get into a rut of just sleeping late on a Sunday and not attending church. We neglect the daily spiritual disciplines. We, we, we stop going to Bible study because oh, it's, it's late and we're tired. We didn't mean to get cast, but we just stop paying attention. We stop focusing on the shepherd. We just careless and we forget God. And we choose comfort over obedience. But the seriousness of God's word this morning is do you even realize and recognize the seriousness of your situation if you're a cast sheep? But the second way a sheep can get cast is from excess wool and excess fat and just weight and a a flabbiness. And a sheep literally becomes weighed down by wool that hasn't been sheared. And so for a, a, a sheep that, that has wandered away and the, the, the wool has continued to grow, there's just this weighing down and that wool becomes matted and knotted with manure and mud and, and sticks and all sorts of other things. And the wool can grow to such a, a point that it can cause wool blindness. And if you Google sheep, it's a tragic thing to see sheep that cannot see out of their eyes. They're not even aware of where they're going. They're not aware of their lostness. They're not aware of the danger that they're in. They can hear the predators and they're freaking out and they're bleating, but there's nothing that they can do. Are you blind to the subtle daily growth of sin in your life? As the scriptures say, worry and anxiety is choking out the word of God, a blindness, not recognizing that actually maybe you're taking steps away from God and now your life has become matted with the world and there's, you've picked up burrs and thorns from, from, from being in the world. See, brothers and sisters, backsliding happens in the heart long before it happens externally. It's kind of like a sinkhole. Things dry up underneath You're not aware of it until suddenly everything starts crashing inwards. And so you can be dry underneath for a very long time before it'll show in your marriage, show in your life, but we all bring our baggage with us into church, into meetings, into work, and eventually it all comes crashing down if we're not where we should be. Maybe your experience of God becomes, yeah, I have an experience of God six months ago, or you know, my freshest testimony is three years ago. That's the one I always get asked to share, and the one from five years ago. But there's not a freshness in your walk with God. You look back and you say, yeah, I remember when I was a teenager on those missions trips. Then I was on fire for God. And when I was a university student, yeah, and when we were first married, but you know, now 20 years has gone by. And so you still come to church. You're here this morning, but you know there's a disconnect between the outside and the inside. There's a, there's a form of hypocrisy. And perhaps like the church of Laodicea, Jesus says some harsh things because he wants to arouse you to your lostness. He wants to cut back the wool so that you'd see the light. And he says, you say, I am rich, I have acquired wealth, and I do not need a thing. 
But the shepherd says, you do not realize that you're wretched, pitiful, poor, and blind. And sometimes the shepherd has to wound us before we recognize his grace. And those words, they do wound us because they, they, they wound our egos. They wound our self-sufficiency because we still want to say, I don't need a shepherd. I can hide by this rock. I can hide by this tree. Do I really need a shepherd to find me? I've got it together. I'm a CEO. And yet Hebrews 12 and verse 1 says, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles and let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us. There's a shedding that's got to happen to be able to follow the paths of righteousness. And so we look out on a cast sheep and we see these vultures circling, waiting to dive bomb, waiting to devour. Death seems certain. Satan, hellish forces, the enemy, the world, sin and guilt, even your own conscience is hovering. And when you're in that place and you come to your senses like the prodigal son, you just feel the weight of your sin and it's as though you're gonna die in that sin. And you might cry out and you might bleat and say, the Lord is just and fair to abandon me. The Lord is just and fair to forget me. The Lord is just and fair to allow me to die in my sin. I must justly perish. And yet, as impossible as it may seem, you will not die today, O sheep of God. You will not. Because there's hope in our text number two. He restores my soul. My shepherd's concern is to restore me. We've looked at my sheep condition, but let's look away now and let's look at my shepherd's concern. Yes, it's true, David is a wanderer, but do you know that there is a more amazing truth than David is a wanderer? It is that God is a restorer, amen? That is great news, that is great blessing. And the good shepherd is diligent in watching over us. He counts his sheep, he knows when you're missing. He's not aloof, he's not an absent shepherd. He's always diligently watching to see, oh, oh, birds of prey hovering. Is one of my sheep cast? He's always got ears that are listening. Hey, that bleat of distress, is that one of my sheep that has wandered off? Where are they? Could they be cast somewhere? And the good shepherd is diligent in finding us. We don't have time to unpack what did it cost the shepherd to find us. But it's one cost to find us, it's another cost to bring us back when our legs cannot walk because we're too panic stricken and the shepherd has to put us on his shoulders and bring us back. There's a cost to find and there's a cost to restore. Philip Keller in that excellent book that I referred to before called A Shepherd Looks at Psalm 23, I encourage you to try and buy it, it's sold millions of copies and um, it's really helped me to understand some of the background. He is a shepherd uh, recounts this in his book, A Shepherd Looks at Psalm 23. Yeah. Philip Keller says again and again, I would spend hours searching for a single sheep that was missing. More often than not, I would see it at a distance, down on its back, lying helpless. At once, I'd start to run toward it, hurrying as fast as I could, for every minute was crucial. My first impulse was to pick it up. Tenderly, I'd roll the sheep onto its side. This would relieve the pressure of gases in the room and if she'd been down for long, I'd have to lift her onto her feet. Then straddling the sheep with my legs, I would hold her, rubbing her limbs to restore the circulation to her legs. This often took quite a little while. And when the sheep started to walk again, she often just stumbled, staggered, and collapsed in a heap once more. What a tender picture of how your shepherd comes to look for you. And even this week, I was amazed at God's sovereignty. I met with two people who told me their stories of restoration. One, a man who used to himself be in ministry. He was a youth pastor, turned his back on the church and on God, and has wandered away for 12 years in another career, and God brought him here in his sovereignty to Rosebank Union Church in December. He said to me, Justin, this is the first time Myself and my family have ever come to a Christmas Day service. And God is at work in his life. God is calling him back. God is restoring him. What a joy. And the countless people I think about, people who've been in ministry with me, colleagues who want nothing to do with God. I think of another youth pastor that a young person of mine bumped into at a sporting event, heard this guy cursing God's name and said, hang on a minute, I remember you, weren't you the youth pastor there? He grabbed this guy by the scruff of the neck and he said, you don't ever say that in public. I want nothing to do with God. How does that happen? Could that happen to us? Matthew Henry says, 
Though God may allow his people to fall into sin, he will not allow them to lie still in it. Why that aggression from that guy? Because God is at work. God is still pursuing him. God is still calling him on a sports field far outside the doors of a church. God will not let you rest. I believe that a backslider has it harder than an unbeliever because God will continue to pursue his sheep. And if they're truly his sheep, I believe he will bring them back. God never leaves us alone. His tender grace comes to us and convicts us of sin. What we once thought was sweet and attractive, God takes the mask off and we see the horror for what it is. This is evil, I should be running away, I should be escaping, I should be saying, this is me, get me out of here. And that's God's grace to reveal sin in its true colors, to turn its sweetness to bitterness. It's his kindness that leads us to repentance. And then God in his grace restores us by shearing that will. He comes to us and he holds us close and he says, look at this manure and he gets his hands into the filth of our lives and he cuts it off. And it's painful for him because he sees our response. It's painful for us as a sheep. We're now gonna be exposed to the sun, but he knows that even sunburn is better than death. In his mercy, he sees certain of us always taking the least line of resistance. He has to unsettle us, he has to shake us. And when things in our life are shaken, maybe it's God saying, you're too comfortable. I wanna remind you, don't lie here. There's a danger in choosing comfort over obedience. And God has to sometimes put us on certain rations and diets to wean us from the world and our flabbiness. Restoration is not without pain. And he disciplines us in love so that we would walk in the paths of righteousness and these same things won't lead us away again and again. Listen to Hebrews chapter 12 from verse seven. Endure hardship as discipline. God is treating you as sons. For what son is not disciplined by his father? And if you're not disciplined, and everyone undergoes discipline, then you are illegitimate children and not true sons. Our fathers disciplined us for a little while as they thought best. But God disciplines us for our good, that we may share in his holiness. No discipline seems pleasant at the time. Can I get an amen? No discipline seems pleasant at the time, neither as a kid nor as a sheep of the shepherd. No discipline seems pleasant at the time, but painful. Later on, however, later on, it produces a harvest of righteousness and peace for those who have been trained by it. For those who've been trained, even as a sheep, you can resist that discipline and you could say, no, I still want to stay here. That's how stubborn we can be. It produces a harvest for those who've been trained by it. And the writer to the Hebrews ends the section by saying, therefore, strengthen your feeble arms and strengthen your weak knees. Oh, sheep, strengthen them, even as God loves you through discipline. But I want you to see in our text, our shepherd goes even further. We've looked at my sheep condition. We've looked at my shepherd's concern. Now, thirdly, what I see in our text is my shepherd's call. He calls me, and he simply says, follow me. Follow me daily. He guides me in paths of righteousness. That's his call. Keep following me. It's not enough for the shepherd to discipline you. It's not even enough for the shepherd to restore you. He now says, I want you to keep looking looking to me, I want you to keep following, I want you to keep taking daily steps towards righteousness. Our repentance is half-baked if we only come here and turn away from sin. True repentance turns away from sin and then turns towards God and follows. And so half-baked repentance says, okay, I've put this stuff off, I've stopped doing this stuff, but that's not how you become holy. That's not how you become Christ-like. You also need to say, now I need to follow Christ. I need to look to him to become Christ-like. And I think back of a young adult that I, I tried to help a few years ago who I was discipling around uh, just trying to deal with pornography in his life. And he'd struggled for so long. I'm trying to put this off. I'm trying to put this off. I'm trying to stop. It's not working. I can't stop it. This thing's got a hold of me. And then we began to say, let's just come this side. And I wanna give you this book to read about the supremacy of Christ, the sufficiency of Christ, his beauty. Let's meditate in God's word together. Let's see who Christ is. Let's and you know what happened? When he fell in love again with the all-satisfying Christ, as he looked aside, he said, is that the horror of what I've been doing? Is this the disgusting filth that I've been entertaining? He saw it for what it was. And when sheep blindly follow other sheep or they follow their own way, they get lost. 
We're called to follow the shepherd. And so you might not think about this, but coming to church, reading God's word, praying, meditating on God's word, obeying, loving your neighbor, taking communion, serving Christ in ministry, being held accountable in community is all God's means of grace and many more to keep you persevering, to keep you pressing into righteousness. That's why you can't give up. You need to keep pushing on because that's God's means. Yes, he's holding on to you primarily. It's not about you holding on to him. But God uses these means to enable you to persevere. And Jesus said in John 10, 25, my sheep listen to my voice. I know them and they follow me. It's only his voice that leads to these paths of righteousness and life. Because Jesus said in Matthew 7, enter through the narrow gate, for wide is the gate and broad is the road that leads to destruction and many enter through it. But small is the gate and narrow is the road that leads to life and only a few find it. Well, can I ask a question of our text and of ourselves? Before we come to this last point, it's gonna introduce this last point and it's an important question. If the flock is so stubborn, if the flock is so prone to keep veering off, they have this tendency to bend away, then the question I've got is, why doesn't the shepherd just abandon us? Why doesn't he say, I've had it with this flock, I'm buying a new flock, and we're moving on? Why? Why doesn't he do that? Because there's a fourth thing in our text. It's my shepherd's cause. It's the cause, it's the reason that lies behind why he doesn't just start over. It's his own glory. Because our text says, he guides me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. It's for his name's sake. God's glory is at stake. In the Middle East, it's a shame pride culture. You can Google what shame pride cultures are. We in the West have a slightly different culture, but things are changing here, I believe, with Facebook and the, the way we shame people. If we take photos of them, they, we're actually becoming more of a shame pride culture where we're using shame on people culturally to cause them to do stuff. But in the Middle East, that's common. You can bring shame upon your family and your society. You don't live to yourself. And so for a shepherd to, to have sheep that are, are lost and bruised and broken is an affront to him. It's a, it's, God's reputation is at stake. It's, it's his own name that's at stake if his sheep are left to die. And I saw horrific footage online of a sheep farm in Australia where the shepherd had just neglected the sheep. The pictures were gruesome and graphic of, of carcasses rotting and maggots infested. And then there was this one poor cast sheep right near the farmhouse window, lying on its back, dead, the intestines burst out, the stomach open. And this is what the caption underneath that picture read. This sheep was in full view of the farmer's house. In fact, that farmer got prosecuted. But the farmer did nothing. Maybe he was the hired hand, maybe he was in it for the money, because the true shepherd's in it for the sheep. The good shepherd cares about the sheep for his name's sake. And I want you to know, brother and sister, that if you are in Christ, you were bought with a price. Eastern shepherds were not very wealthy. And so the single most important event in a young shepherd's life as he grew up in that culture was the ability to buy sheep for himself with blood, sweat, and tears to earn those sheep and to say, these are mine. And he became part of the sheep, and his sheep became part of him. And a good shepherd in his heart was connected to his sheep in this powerful way, bound his whole life to them. So Joel Beakey writes, Joel Beakey says, Sheep of God, may your shepherd give you an eye to behold him and a heart to confess in amazement. Great shepherd, redeemer, are you so bound with eternal love ties, blood ties, and purchasing ties to such a foolish sheep as I am, that it was the most important event of your life when you gave your all on Calvary to pay the full price, and when you paid that price crying out at the moment of full payment, it is finished. Oh, my soul, stand with sacred amazement. Cover your mouth with holy silence. Bow your heart in reverent adoration. Take shoes off your feet and behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Just imagine for a moment if God based his shepherding on your good name. 
if God based his shepherding on your ability to follow him all the time, if he based his love of you and his care of you and even his restoration of you on your performance, the scriptures say, well, then who could stand? None of us can stand. We'd be lying there flat on our backs, unable to lift a finger to save ourselves. Nothing we can do. He'd never come looking for you if it was dependent on you. I'm only gonna take care of these good ones, but that one that's gone away, no, I'm staying with the 99. These guys know what they're doing, and that guy, I mean, he's been off how many times? Forget him. No. It's not based. It's based on his character and his name and his reputation that he leaves the 99 and he goes after the one. And astoundingly, God is at work to display his glory through you. Take your skin and pinch yourself. God is at work to display his glory through you, a wandering sheep. Why? So that he can get the glory that one day we look like Christ and we think, how on earth has he made me to look like Christ when I'm all over the place like a bowling ball on the bowling green? God leads you for his own glory. Your salvation is primarily about his glory. It's not about you. That's a radical, radical thought. It's for the display of his good shepherding. Yes, all the secondary benefits come to you, but he's leading you primarily for his name's sake, which is what Romans says. For from him and through him and to him are all things to him be the glory forever. And as we go into this week of prayer, for his name's sake should be a catalyst for our prayers, not to just tack on this jargon in Jesus' name, amen. No, this is for your glory, Lord. We want your glory to be seen in us, in our church. Lord, we don't wanna be a church that fails you, that falls, that the world looks and says, oh, where's their God, where's his power? Look at their pastors, look at their leaders, look at the sin, ah, oh, they're no different from us. No, Lord, for your name, for your glory, we don't wanna ruin your reputation, Lord. That's what revival is. It's always been fueled by a crying out for God's name and honor and reputation to be in us and through us. That's why David prays in Psalm 25, for the sake of your name, O Lord, forgive my iniquity, iniquity, though it's great. Asaph in Psalm 79, for the glory of your name, deliver us and forgive our sins for your name's sake. And you can search for your name's sake and you'll see it everywhere through the scriptures. So can I leave us with three brief and final challenges as we come to the end of verse three? Number one, will you guard daily? That's what I think our text is asking us to admit. If you're willing to admit that you're a wanderer, it will enable you to guard daily. If you're a Pharisee who thinks they've got it all together, who never veers off, who's been in church, never misses, never misses a quiet time, there are still subtle things in your heart. The key is to face this reality and be as honest as David was. Yes, Lord, I'm not gonna run, I'm not gonna hide. I am a wanderer, I am prone to wander because that will make you God daily. I think of my Bible college principal and I might have told you this story before. The morning after I'd graduated, the night before I got a phone call from an administrator there, as did all of the other students. Hi, Justin, we're just calling to say that the principal of your Bible college uh, has been having an affair with a student for the last six months. The guy that I looked up to, that I respected, it couldn't have done anything wrong in my eyes. He was a godly man who knew the scriptures better than anyone else I know, who was one of the most fervent preachers, almost a revival preacher. And you know what happened that afternoon? Students started to phone each other. Some of my friends said, well, I'm taking all my notes from him. I'm gonna put them in the briar and I'm burning a lot of them. Everything that that guy said is a load of rubbish. I, I shouldn't have listened to him. And as I wrestled, I said to myself, Justin, if it can happen to him, it can happen to you. He's godlier than you. He's been around the block more. He's had people in his life. He's been on the road longer than you. If it can happen to him, it can happen to you. And that sobered me. I'm so grateful that before I'd put one day in full-time ministry, God had showed me that because by his grace, it's enabled me to God. And even as I say that, I dare not say that, that with presumptuousness because that was Peter. That was Peter. He wasn't guarding his life. Why? Because he thought he had it all together. Lord, look at all those sheep, the other 11. Those are the kind of guys you can't trust. Those are the kind of guys that are gonna disappear and run away. But me, Lord, I got it together. And I'm promising you here and now that no matter what happens to them, if they abandon and scatter, even if all fall away on account of you, Lord, I never will. And what happened? Two seconds later, he's outside weeping bitterly. Not only because he's displeased his savior, because the pride came before a fall. He was so presumptuous that he never guarded. And that's why the scriptures tell us, 
Apostle Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 10. So if you think you're standing firm, be careful that you don't fall. No temptation ever comes that is not common to man. It's common to all of us in the right situation. We need a God daily. And number two, will you follow daily? This is a profound thought, but will you recognize that every small act of faith, when you get up early tomorrow morning and you have a quiet time, I know it seems like nothing's happening, but the Apostle Paul says when a man sows is what he'll reap. Every seed that you're sowing is bearing fruit. Every small prayer, every small gesture, every act of love, every person you've cared about, every obedience, one small step in the right direction is preserving you and keeping you. And so keep your eyes on him. Maybe you don't remember all the sermons you've heard. I'm sure you don't. Sometimes I can't remember my own sermons that I preached the week before. But the fact is, we eat meals every day. You are sitting here because you're the sum total of every meal that you've eaten. And if you stopped eating for even a short period of time and stopped drinking, you would end up dead. So you are here, even if you can't remember the sermons, even if you can't remember every communion table, by being here, by investing in daily spiritual disciplines, by following daily, you are looking up and seeing Christ. And it's so subtle when we don't. It's like the little child on the beach. Oh, here's another exciting rock pool. Wow, here's a, a starfish. Here's a shiny object. Here's a shell. And when we turn and look, our parents are nowhere to be seen on the horizon. We got lost. We didn't intend to. And the reverse is true. Daily following Christ leads us to righteousness. And then thirdly, will you revel daily? Not rebel, not rebel, revel. Will you revel daily? Will you see Christ against the backdrop of your sin? Over the years, I've been in various churches, and I can tell you the people I've respected the most and the prayer meetings I've most enjoyed are guys that are honest about their sin and honest about the grace of Christ. There's a warmth because they see their sin. Yes, they do, but they don't dwell there. They see the beauty of Christ. And people who don't see their sin, who think they've got it all together, don't see the beauty of Christ because he's just a hobby. He's just... Uh, somebody at the gym to, to, to help me, just a, a, a psychologist to just cheer me up and give me words. No, he's a savior because I'm lost. And so reveling daily means, yes, I do see this, but I see Christ. And that causes me to worship more. His word is sweet. I'm opening it and saying, is this really your grace to me? Is this really your warning to me? Man, I better listen. Christ is sweeter. His word is sweeter. Friends, will you revel daily? Well, I close with the story of Robert Robinson. I quoted his hymn earlier in the sermon, the one about prone to wander, Lord, I feel it, prone to leave the God I love. I've not been able to verify every part of the story. There's differing accounts of it. But in later years, it's believed that Robinson, who wrote this hymn, himself abandoned the faith. He moved away from Christ and the uniqueness of Christ and he began to say, oh, it doesn't really matter, Christ's not important. He denied the Trinity and he moved into heresy. And in his backslidden state, the story is told that one day he was riding on a stagecoach and the companion that he had there was, uh, was a young lady. They didn't know each other. She was just on the same stagecoach, not known to him, and she was reading his hymn. She didn't realize who he was, and she just began to strike up a conversation with the hymn writer without knowing it and saying, sure, this hymn's been encouraging me, and she quoted from the hymn. Come thou fount of every blessing, tune my heart to sing thy grace, streams of mercy never ceasing, call for songs of loudest praise. Prone to wander, Lord, I feel it, prone to leave the God I love, here's my heart, O take and seal it, seal it for thy courts above. And Robinson turned to her with tears in his eyes, and he said, Madam, I am the poor, unhappy man who composed that hymn many years ago. And I would give a thousand worlds if I had them to enjoy the feelings I had then. And gently she turned to him and whispered and said, Sir, the streams of mercy are still flowing. The streams of mercy are still flowing. And sheep, this morning as we come to this table, the streams of mercy are still flowing. And as you feel the weight of your sin and you're bleating under the, the, the weight of the will, the Savior is flying. He is flying like a jet on the wings of the wind to come and find you with streams of mercy. And God wants nothing better than to see you and I back on our feet again. Isn't that great news that God wants to see you back on your feet again? because his very glory and your good 
is at stake. Let's pray together. Our great shepherd, we thank you for mercy and grace. That Lord, when we were that sheep and we recognized we were lost, oh Lord, as a sheep does, we, we bleated and bleated. We were out there in the wilderness and then we looked for shelter and protection under a tree or, or near a rock. And Lord, the louder we cried, the greater the risk that a predator would hear us and come under the darkness of night and devour us. But Lord, thank you in your mercy that you have come that you have left the 99 and you've come to look for just me. Thank you, Lord, that now that you've found me, you continue to find me, that you continue to restore me because, Lord, I continue to wander. Oh, Lord, you've given me this desire, as Apostle Paul said, that every time I wanna do good, evil is right there with me. What a wretched man I am. Lord, we feel that. Lord, we don't ever wanna sin and feel nothing. We want to sin and we want to feel the full weight of it because, Lord, we sin in the face of grace. But thank you that there is grace, that the streams of mercy are flowing, that as we come to this table this morning, Lord, that you wanna meet with us, that you even wanna restore us here. Lord, maybe it's only one step we've taken away, maybe we're a million miles away. Lord, thank you that you come whatever the distance, you cannot stand the distance, and you come for the sake of your name and your glory and your reputation and our good, because Lord, you've bought us with a price. Oh, Lord, impress these deep truths on our hearts till, till as the hymn says, Lord, that you take our hearts and you seal them and you tether us to you. Oh, Lord, do that. We pray again this morning. In Jesus' name, amen.